Welcome to this live event at Copenhagen International Citizen Days. My name is Paula Lorraine and I will be your host the next coming hour. Learn more about this event right here. Each year, Copenhagen welcomes more than 20,000 new international citizens who deserve a good start to their new lives in Denmark. This year, International Citizen Days goes virtual in a brand new format with live stream talks, chat rooms, and experts on our online platform. Each day, there will be a one hour live broadcast where we talk with exciting guests at the main stage. And you'll be able to interact and ask questions in real time. After the talks on the main stage, join the booths for live talks with representatives and experts from organizations and communities in Greater Copenhagen. Do you have questions or perhaps just want to chat with other internationals? Check out the lounge where you can chat with other participants about their experiences with living in Copenhagen. All three days of the online event feature a different theme, so come back each day for a new topic. At the end of the week, on Saturday the 19th of September, get out and explore Copenhagen through guided tours, open houses, and social activities with other internationals. We look forward to inspiring you. After this program, you will be able to visit different booths that are ready with experts that can answer all your questions. If you have some, uh, it opens at 6 o'clock right after this event. Today, our focus will be on jobs and career opportunities. Would you like to understand the Danish tax system and traditional model of collective bargaining? How do you improve your chances of finding a good job or pursuing a certain career? And what are the inescapable codes of Danish workplace culture that you cannot miss? Public and private experts, including the Danish tax authorities, employees associations, and trade unions, are ready to provide you with great insights while at the same time helping you fulfill your professional self. Welcome to day three of International Citizen Days. Welcome to you, Cecilia Longin Skogård. You are the mayor of Copenhagen in charge of employment. And first of all, I would like to uh, ask you, why is it important for the municipality and for yourself to help international citizens get employment in Copenhagen? Well, uh, thank you and uh, thanks for, for, for allowing me to be here and uh, also uh, welcome to all of you uh, listening in on this. It's important to us because when we ask uh, companies in and around Copenhagen what their main concern is, they all answer access to you know, skill, skills access to uh, labor who is uh, you know studied the right things who uh, have uh, work experience in the right subjects and uh, the same goes whether we ask uh, our startup uh, communities whether we ask you know big tech companies our pharma and medical companies they all come back to this so basically uh, we need international talent here to continue to thrive and grow uh, as a city, and uh, that's why we work intensively uh, to, to maintain our focus on this agenda. Mm -hmm. And how do you help international citizens get uh, more job opportunities in Copenhagen? We really work, uh, I would say, on a twofold agenda. First, we uh, try to uh, equip uh, our international talent, whether they are students, uh, uh, experienced labor, even spouses, uh, accompanying uh, expats uh, being here. Uh, we try to uh, help them uh, to uh, uh, train for interviews, apply for jobs, we uh, hook them up with their uh, mentors and so on. So we really try to equip them to, to get a job. But we also spend quite a, a great deal of time visiting companies, uh, listening to their concerns, uh, understanding you know, what are the potential barriers preventing them from uh, just uh, employing the international talent that's already here. And one example we've had is uh, some of the administrative hassle around it, uh, and I'm happy to say that we just found the funding to ensure a more digital entry process for international talent coming to Denmark. That was a huge uh, request on the side of the companies, and um, it's great that we can then uh, go in and actually deliver a solution that works for everyone's benefit. Mm. And now it's uh, sort <coughs> of an extraordinary situation at the moment because the whole world is experiencing a pandemic of the COVID-19. How has that influenced uh, your view on how businesses are thriving at the moment and the, uh, the employment situation? The interesting thing is that when we ask our businesses, you know, large or small, they all point uh, to the fact that uh, their demand for international skilled labor uh, is the same. Uh, the large companies continue to uh, uh, attract uh, expats to, uh, to Copenhagen and uh, the surroundings of Copenhagen. Uh, 
I've even heard a few companies mentioning to me that they, they find that the expats who were only supposed to be here for three or five years in the current situation actually don't want to leave Denmark. Um, but overall, uh, the, the pattern stays the same. Companies tell me that they have uh, adapted their recruitment processes, so obviously moved a larger part of the recruitment process online. Uh, but other than that, there seems to be you know, a sa the same demand for international mm -hmm. talent. And that, of course, tells me that as a city, we also need to uh, uh, keep the, the gear up and we need to uh, maintain uh, our focus and our support in this uh, area. Yes, because it might not only be just for now, because the, uh, the whole adjustment will be probably longer. This is an adjustment. We're doing this on a broadcast on the internet because we were supposed to do it live. How uh, is the digitalization uh, going forward in, in, in Copenhagen in this respect? Obviously, we as a municipality are also uh, looking into ways of uh, engaging with our citizens and our companies in more digital ways. Uh, we are offering, in terms of the companies, we are offering uh, webinars, uh, helping uh, our small and medium-sized companies to be more present online and uh, transfer part of their existing business to the uh, online uh, forum. Mm. And as for citizens, uh, we are also offering more and more digital services. By now, you can... Uh, have most of your conversation with the municipality online, even video meetings. I think that was uh, somewhat unheard of just six months ago. So we are just in very quickly here. Thank you very much for coming here and explaining all of this and, and welcoming everybody to this in an official way. Thank you so You're much. You're most welcome, Linda. Mm -hmm. Next, we'll be talking about the cultural barriers, barriers in the workplace in Denmark. Welcome, Nivedita Eskesen. Uh, you have a British background and have experience not only as an expat yourself in other countries also, and not only in Denmark, but also as a cross-culture consultant in Denmark. So you're the right person to ask this. Um, what is the special thing about the, a Danish workplace uh, when you look, for instance, in terms of hierarchy? Yeah, firstly, I just want to say thank you uh, for inviting me and International House for inviting me to talk about this because this is probably one of my most favorite things mm -hmm. to talk about. But if you're thinking of equality in the Danish workplace, you know, I've uh, worked with expats for many years and I have to say that um, the fact that, uh, you know, it's quite informal actually in uh, in the Danish workplace. The fact that, you know, you're calling your bosses uh, by your first name and the fact that it's not so formal even in the dress, uh, uh, what people are wearing to work and so on, you know, it creates this very nice informal atmosphere. The uh, boss's door is uh, pretty much always open. You can always stop your boss in the middle of uh, the corridor and have a chat. I don't know uh, many countries where that is possible, to be honest. And, you know, I have to say it's very also very dependent on uh, which company. And I mean, I'm sure things are different in a startup. But generally, there is this tendency for it to be a little bit more informal in uh, the Danish workplace. And I have to say, this is something that expats think are wonderful. Uh, you know, the fact that you can you have such great access to uh, to senior managers and so on. What is the flip side of navigating such a system where you don't have a hierarchy and where you can say, OK, the boss is the boss and you uh, do as the boss say, says? What is the flip side of that? You know, I think there's a, a few things that uh, I know that I encourage expats to do that might be a little different. And that would be, for example, if you are in a meeting with uh, quite a few senior managers or stakeholders, you know, and someone says, what do you think? Then perhaps, you know, 
maybe you're not used to that, you know, to actually voice an opinion um, in front of some uh, senior people from the company. But this is something that you should, uh, as an expat, really take advantage of, you know, when, when people uh, say, you know, what's your opinion, just uh, practice actually coming out there and uh, getting used to it because it's respected mm. here, right? You know, when someone asks you, what is your opinion, to actually speak up and say. Mm. And also, um, when there's no hierarchy, people tend to be a little direct, you know, in the Danish culture, we're very direct. We say things as we see them and very directly mm -hmm. without uh, wanting to sound rude. But how does it sound when you're an international, when you get, you know, a very direct message from a, a, a Dane? Yes. And I think uh, this is uh, this is, again, a little bit of the flip side. You know, it's a combination of a lot of things, I guess. Mm -hmm. But uh, the flip side is, you know, when you are in an equal society, people do speak to you the same way that they speak to their moms, to a stranger, to, you know, th there's no real difference. And, you know, coming from a British background where we, we can really be overly polite, actually, you know, um, you can really notice the difference, you know, the um, things can uh, seem quite direct. And um, and I think, quite frankly, I think it's uh, it's also a matter of how we perceive the message, right? I think uh, it's very important for foreigners that they do get a little offended, that they stop and think, perhaps uh, we should think about what the intention is. You know, I, I don't think any Dane out there is purposefully trying to offend you. Another thing that I think that plays a part, and this is something I, I really try to emphasize, um, is that, you know, two people speaking English doesn't necessarily mean they're speaking the same language. Uh, and the reason I say that is uh, Perhaps some of the expats out there are also speaking English as a second language. And if you have a Dane speaking English as a second language, you know, there are so many things that can get lost in translation, right? I mean, just a little example. Um, I hear a lot of expats, uh, you know, saying yeah, they're so rude, you know, they never say please. And I, I, it sort of dawned on me, you know, they're... There is no please. The language, uh, the word please, doesn't actually exist in the Danish l language, right? So th there's nothing to translate. Um, and when people are speaking a second language, normally they're translating from their first language. But what I normally say is, you know, maybe they're not saying please, but they have a million ways of saying thank you. You know, they say thank you for absolutely everything. So if you're going to learn anything <laughs> about the Danish language, then uh, make sure you learn all those lovely phrases they have to say thank you for the food and thank you for this and thank you for that. So and that's thank a good you for the last time. Yeah, you know, thank you. <laughs> which, which is something you have to, to learn about about. Exactly. Um, other than, than uh, the language, do you have uh, examples of misunderstandings that can go around in a workplace where you have internationals and, and Danes coming together in a, in, a, in a language like English? Yeah, I think uh, more than um, the language, I'm thinking that, you know, things are just misinterpreted, you know. I think, uh, for example, um, we were talking... Um, yeah, I was talking to a colleague actually about this uh, micromanagement. You mm -hmm. know, there's a, there was um, this uh, colleague of mine, a uh, previous colleague of mine actually, was uh, talking to me about how how it's really freeing that uh, that you know the manager isn't all over you. You know, th uh, throughout your work, this is something that you see in many of the other cultures around, right? But actually, many years ago, I was speaking to an expat who who found it very disturbing. You know, I'm performing, I'm doing so well, I'm delivering on time, and I am getting no feedback. Mm. I'm not being told whether this is good, the work that I'm doing, or whether it's really bad. And frankly, I feel the fact that the, my boss isn't uh, giving me any feedback, feedback that I can't help thinking that he's not pleased. Mm. So this is also something that uh, that um, expats can easily misunderstand, you know, that uh, that if there isn't uh, feedback and constant uh, dialogue with your manager, that uh, maybe there's there's something wrong. But I can always uh, encourage expats out there to take the time and ask, because there is a trust that you will go and ask for help or go and ask for feedback if you need it. Mm. And uh, what uh, about in terms of uh, social life? Uh, because uh, we have uh, what we call, at least we try to protect work-life balance, and we don't work so many hours in, uh, than in other places. How do you see that as a difference between Danes and other countries? 
Well, honestly, I think uh, it's a wonderful thing. And, uh, you know, the people I've spoken to have uh, really taken advantage of it. It takes a bit of adjusting, right? Mm -hmm. But it's four o'clock. Where is everybody? Uh, why am I the only person sitting here? You know, so I think it's something that you get used to. But the, the people who really can take advantage of it and think, you know what, I'm actually going to go home and I'm going to go and have a life. You know, they're the ones who get a lot out of it. But I have met some who find it really strange, you know, and are finding it very difficult to adjust to that work life balance. But again, you know, for the expats out there, take advantage of it. You know, it's not very many countries that you have that opportunity. Saying that, it's not that Danes uh, don't put in the hours. I can mm. tell you that. I mean, even I uh, log on after the kids are in bed sometimes just to make sure my work's done. So uh, I think that's how we uh, prioritize differently. Yeah, but it must be also a little bit different. I, I'm thinking about, you know, how you live in London when you're a professional or in, in Italy, the bigger cities where you go out with your colleagues after work. Uh, people don't do that so much in, in Denmark. Mm. How is that when you come as an international you want to have a social life with your colleagues is that different yeah it's so mm -hmm. different i think personally i think when i when i moved here i really missed it i really missed it um and i think that the, the, there's a lot of uh, maybe some um, misinterpretations or things get talked about in the pub or wherever it is you're meeting in the restaurant with your colleagues right but if you don't have that uh, at work you can really miss it as an expat But saying that, you also have to realize that uh, there are certain slots in the day where you get to socialize with your colleagues. So if you are an expat, make sure that you join your colleagues because they will all go to lunch together. They will be Friday morning breakfasts. So there are certain time slots in the calendar, if you want to put it like that, mm. that you, you go and socialize with your colleagues. And if you really do need that time after work, can highly recommend, you know, being the one taking the initiative uh, and uh, putting something in the calendar a few weeks in advance so people can arrange uh, their calendars around it. Yeah. So speaking about time slots, that's a difference that we hear often, that uh, Danes are really, they plan ahead, so they put everything in a schedule. Mm. So that's one of the things that you have to teach internationals when they come here, put things in a schedule. You <laughs> don't have to expect spontane spontaneity. We, yeah, I think for sure, because, um, you know, I've, I've always loved being spontaneous. And again, you know, we're putting people into boxes here. Uh, but, uh, you know, I have met Danes who like to be spontaneous, even if they have kids and from friends from kindergarten and whatever not, right? But I do notice that, you know, if... Uh, Things do need to be planned. I think uh, that's uh, probably where the biggest uh, chance of something actually going through uh, is, is if you plan and uh It's it's just another thing to get used to. Frankly, I think, you know, talking about uh, all these ins and outs, there are so many nuances um, in any culture. There are so many <coughs> nuances that uh, that y it's that you need to get to know. And um It's difficult to to get all that information. So I would strongly suggest that if you do go to a, uh, if you do uh, start work in a new company or uh, you get a job in Denmark, then make sure that you uh, get a buddy or somebody that you can ask these questions to.
And if you want some more good advice from internationals who know how the Danish workplace works uh, in terms of culture and language and all that, you can visit Living Library, uh, the booth that is open from six o'clock where you can meet other internationals that have been through the whole experience. If you want to improve your professional Danish, visit Clevis and Copenhagen Language Center who are ready to assist you also at six o'clock. Both all the booths would be open from six o'clock after this broadcast. Next up is something, some information about the Danish model, so stay tuned. Welcome to you, Morten Thiesen. Thank you. You are from uh, DIA, uh, who organizes the Danish engineers. Uh, we call it the Danish Society of Engineers. It's really a union, isn't it? It is. It, it is, is a union, yeah. yes, but it looks, it, it sounds different when it's a society, doesn't it? Well, that's because it's more than a union. It's <laughs> more than a union. We'll be talking about that. First, I want to get some facts straight about the Danish uh, workforce and the work market, because it's quite unique. We call it the Danish model. Can you explain to us what the Danish model is? Yeah. The Danish model is basically uh, a dialogue tradition that has lasted now 121 years, uh, where we basically make agreements between employers and employees without any kind of political interference. And so far, more or less successfully, we have managed to keep politicians out of our collective bargaining uh, and the various improvements over time we have had for, uh, for, the, uh, for the terms for, for being a worker in Denmark. Mm -hmm manage to keep the politicians out. Why do you say it in that way? Hmm? Well, the temptation for, for winning voters by, by interfering in, in, the, in the salaries uh, is, yeah, is, very, is very big. If you want to be re-elected, you can always promise more money tomorrow. Fortunately, we never had that here. Uh, we've tried to uh, fix the problems on our own, and I would say there's been a lot of responsibility taken from both parties to make this uh, model into I would say the most successful uh, organization of, of, uh, of the labor uh, society in any place in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, why is it so su successful? Because we talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, contrary to, to the normal uh, perception of, of labor unions as, as uh, someone being in, in endless conflict with the employers, this is not so. Um, we had a good example in, in our international cooperation uh, with, with other unions in, in the EU. And, and uh, a German uh, uh, se senior from, from one of, of the Metal Workers Association um, pointed out his view on how we should cooperate. And he said, we are a labor union. We make demands. <laughs> and that's not how it works in Denmark. We talk and we agree. And we make agreements that stick for a longer period. Uh, one of the best examples is the way that our pension system uh, is, is made. It is more or less financed completely by the workers themselves. So even if the politicians would, they couldn't interfere because it's our money. Uh, so it's a very good example uh, on, on what you can actually do if you're willing to listen to, uh, to others and, and uh, willing to think out of the box a bit. Mm -hmm. um, and it wouldn't work without the, uh, the national character of, of having a very, very high degree of, of uh, mutual trust. In Denmark, an agreement is an agreement. You don't have to have it in writing. It is just as binding. Um, and that is a tradition that goes long back. So I hope it will last for another thousand years. So far, it is, uh, has served us uh, very well. <clears throat> now, this is the Danish model is one side of it. The um, democratic parliamentarism uh, between the unions uh, and, and the employee or employer and so organizations. Um, the second is kind of the political aspect of it, because of course there has to be a framework in this. Mm. Um, and we call it the flex security model. Meaning that we as unions accept uh, that there is a very limited uh, termination period compared to other countries. Um, so it's, it's easy to, to get rid of, of uh, redundant labor. Um, as a counterbalance to this, we have uh, uh, a unemployment benefit scheme uh, which is basically a private uh, insurance, but it is subsidized by the government uh, to make sure that if we have deep, deep depression, uh, the, the, the unemployment uh, organization will not run out of money. <clears throat> and as a, as a third part of that, we have what we call uh, an active employment policy, meaning that we will retrain uh, the, the unemployed uh, to other positions where they're more needed. Uh, so it's basically a very liberal uh, system, 
and has worked reasonably well. It has its challenges now um, because of the the uh, the coverage of the unemployment level has, has dropped relatively to to the salary increases. So, so there's, there's more flexi than security at the moment. Yeah, we? right yeah. now we we're not too happy about the balance, so we need to talk about that. Okay. Um, um, also between the unions, because of course there, there's different coverages depending on your unemployment uh, period and and uh, your, your risk of getting on un- uh, out of job, uh, which is also very diff- uh, different from group to group. So that is why you organize you're organizing like two legs. You have a union part and you have a ekkase. Yep. That's the, the, the place where you go to when you are unemployed and you need some, uh, some assistance in that, yep. uh, in that respect. Correct. If you're an international and you lose your job in Denmark and you are not organized, what do you do then? Well, basically, you're in you're in a tough place then, mm-hmm. and, um, and this is why you, should, of course, should be a member of a labor union. You should also be uh, have your unemployment uh, benefits uh, checked out. So, <clears throat> in that case, depending a bit on the terms that you are here, there will be nothing for you. It is uh, more or less uh, you have three months to get a new job; otherwise, it's out. Um, and that that is that is actually uh, i would say one of the, the biggest benefits of of taking this sublime orga- uh, organization in into your life because this really gives you some calm and some some security um and also gives you a, rel- a very large network for for uh, finding a new job mm-hmm. um and getting the qualifications that will uh, make you eligible for it You were mentioning that you did a lot of things. That's why you called a society and not a, a union. What other things can you uh, offer uh, an international if this person uh, becomes unemployed? Well, basically, uh, a lot, uh, a lot of uh, of access to the training is organized by the labor unions. Um, but one of the more important things uh, is actually the network that we can provide. Uh, we have. Because we are a society, a lot of networks which are centered about uh, around technologies, or they are centered around regions uh, where they have a more a so more social content. So this will actually, being a member of the of the uh, Engineers Association in Denmark, will give you an access to to a network of more than 100,000 people uh, all over Denmark, um, and you can easily browse through the groups in in terms of interest and and uh, geographical uh, p- uh, position. So you can find something that matches your requirements. Um, I would say that's where we—that's the association part of it. Uh, of course, the labor union does what labor unions do. However, in a Danian, in, in a Danish matter, uh, meaning that of course we have a relatively high le- level of collective uh, collective bargaining in, uh, in Denmark. Two thirds of of, of uh, the employees in, in in Denmark are more or less covered by um, some kind of. Of collective bargaining, and they're also union members. Um, so it's not that it's an odd thing to be uh, a union member. That's the normal thing, and it's not because that your employer will see, "Oh, you, you're a real rebel. You're a union member." No, everybody are. But it's it has much less conflict uh, potential in in the Danish context mm. than it has in other places. Um, we also talk a lot with uh, with uh, the employers, uh, especially about training. We would like to be trained so we can get higher salaries, and they would like to have us trained because then they, uh, their business will be supported. Um, and this is also why um, we, as, as uh, the Engineers Association, uh, welcome our, our international colleagues a lot because their presence here enables the companies to grow so they can get more engineer jobs. It's kind of a positive circle. Mm. Um, and we have since, I don't know, more than 20 years, Uh, seen an, an increasing interest in, in international uh, candidates, um, and over the years we have also been able to service them in, in a much better way than we did initially. Mm-hmm. Um, now we try to keep approximately 10 percent of our uh, various technical and social arrangement in English, so they are accessible uh, to to also our, our international members. Um, and of course, we try to recruit massively. Uh, among uh, the internationals coming, coming to Denmark. As an example, there are about mm. 10,000 uh, foreign engineers in Denmark, and we organize about one third of them. We would like to have the two other thirds, of course. Um, some of them 
will never choose us because of, of personal preferences. But, but I think a lot of them um, would have a, a huge benefit from, from uh, checking us out and seeing what is really in it for them. But maybe uh, many people make the calculation that if they're a member of an ACAS uh, and they do get unemployed and they get the unemployment benefits, that it would not be enough. So they, they, they tend to use it as an insurance thing. Can they be member of the union and not be member of the ACAS at yeah. the same time? Yeah, any and combination mm -hmm. uh, is possible. Um, at least with, uh, with the, within the academics, it's not controversial at all to, to, to make your choices like, okay, this is good for me and I don't want to be a member of the, of the union, it's perfectly okay. And you don't lose anything in your benefits from that, for sure. It's completely up to you uh, which package suits you. Um, I would say the full package gives you the, the most value for the money, of course. Yeah. I have to say that. <laughs> yes, you're but selling actually, it and that's good. <laughs> but but, I, but I, I don't need to push myself much mm. uh, for it. Uh, in Denmark, also the um, uh, the fees are tax deductible, uh, so it's it's a really good bargain. And mm. together with with other things, for instance, we have very cheap insurances because our record for make, for for damaging our cars and making other messy things is, is very good. Mm. So so um, that's one of the of the nice to haves that comes uh, with with a membership. Because I wanted to ask you if you have to be a member of a union if you are at a certain workplace when you are an engineer. No, absolutely not. And you don't it. force anybody. Mm. No, it's not legal. Mm. <laughs> I think uh, EU uh, outlawed this, I think, 10 years ago. Um, and, and we were never proponents for that. We don't want to force anybody to be members with us. We want people to come by their own free will because it suits their purpose. Uh, and the only way that we can grow is to make more people happy about, about their membership. Um, so really, we... we I understand where this comes from, of course, that you would like to have exclusivity uh, in, in the organization. Um, but this is an old-fashioned uh, way of, of perceiving uh, how a labor union should work. Mm. Um, for, forcing people will, 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 never get the, uh, will never get them to do their best. Um, and you would have internal conflicts on top of the, the usual uh, conflicts that will always be there, but are handled in, I would say, a very positive way in the Danish system. Mm. So if we are very concrete here and, and have to give some information to an international that might lose his job, what is the, um, the unemployment fee or what do you get as an unemployed in Denmark if you are a member of an ACAS? I get about 19,000 uh, Danish kroner um, and it's it's always adjusted according to the inflation. Um, considering the salaries that our, our international members get, uh, this is uh, not a very good uh, coverage. So on top of that, it's possible to buy additional insurance. Um, at least before the COVID crisis, it, this was very cheap. Um, I think the prices have gone up because this is not government subsidized. This is a completely free market uh, for, for additional uh, unemployment uh, insurance. Um, and this is where we, I, I expect us to have some, some interesting development with the level, the general level and the general, general uh, coverage percentage uh, in, in, in Denmark, um, which we think we are entitled to talk about because of the special financing of this system. We have, there's a gross uh, tax on, uh, on the income of 8% that basically is supposed to finance this. Um, doing the, the quick math, um, you can easily tell that this system is hugely overfinanced. Mm. Um, we might think that we would like to get some of our money back. <laughs> so that's what you're counting on? Hmm? No, we're not counting on anything. Mm. No, 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 no. We're working for it. Mm. Um, expectations, well, hard to say, but uh, for sure we will work very hard to, to make sure that we get the best possible benefits for our members. So that's what you do. You work for your members to get the best benefits for them. You don't force them to anything. Yeah, that's what a member organization do. <laughs> Thank you so much, Morten Thiessen, for giving us this lecture on how it works, the Danish model. You're welcome. If you want to know a little bit more about the Danish Society of Engineers, please visit their booth at 6 o'clock after this broadcast. You can also find exciting professional networks such as Creative Business Network, Professional Women of Color and DSG, or learn more about the community that's called Here We Are Global.
If you want to change jobs, you can find assistance at Business House Copenhagen and the organization Work in Denmark. And I have two representatives today with me. Uh, Akila C. Food, you are project associate and business consultant at Business House Copenhagen. And you, Ida Maria Angelo, international recruitment consultant and Work in Denmark. Maybe you should tell a little bit about your organizations. Akila, would you go first? Yeah. Uh, Business House Copenhagen, we are a part of Copenhagen Municipality. We are responsible for the business outreach activities, which the mayor actually mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. So we go out to companies and ask them what their needs are, recruitment needs are, what kind of troubles they're having, what they need in order to grow and thrive in our lovely city. So we have two primary goals. The first one I just mentioned, speaking with the companies. The second goal is making sure that local residents can get a job in Denmark uh, by using or utilizing the information that we have received from the business community. We think that those two things go hand in hand because growth for a company has a direct connection with recruitment. Mm. So recruitment, that's your job. And that's mm? uh, when I come in. <laughs> so I'm representing Work in Denmark, which is part of the Danish Ministry of uh, uh, Employment. And we're also part of the URES, which is a European cooperation network that facilitates the free movement of workers across Europe. Mm. So our main goal is to help Danish companies in attracting and retaining international ta talent in um, sectors where there is a skills shortage. Mm. Mm -hmm. So um, you go out to the businesses to hear what do you need and you help the, the, the employers themselves. How do you concretely go about that, helping, for instance, an international that wants to find another job? That's a very good question. Uh, so we support Danish businesses uh, in several ways. Um, we go about, uh, we go abroad uh, to try to find international talent. So we visit uh, international job fairs, and since uh, COVID-19, it's been digital job fairs. So right now we are finding new formats and new digital formats, and this is actually a very good way to meet international uh, talents uh, within these sectors of robotics, green energy, life science, and biopharma, for instance, and IT, of course. Um, so what we do uh, as well is we have a large job bank where we post Danish vacancies so internationals can find jobs that do not require Danish skills. And also we have a large CV bank, so we try to find all the international talent and gather them in one pool of international talents that Danish companies can access to recruit uh, the specialized people they need in their companies. We've heard a lot about, you know, a lack of employers in certain uh, fields in, 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 in Copenhagen and the whole of Denmark. What do you do concretely to attract more people to come here? How do you sell Denmark? Well, I think mm. that would actually be more mm. of a question mm. for Ida, because mm. she, they work in Denmark has focus on attracting talent from mm. outside of Denmark's mm. borders. Mm. Whereas Business House Copenhagen, we have more focus on local residents. Mm. We also work with recruitment, but as I said before, it is recruitment in terms of local residents. Mm. So when we go out to companies and we ask them what their needs are, if they communicate to us that they actually have a recruitment need, well then we would be able to take that back to local residents, to mm. the job centers, and to some of our other international programs, and advise them, hey, there's an opportunity over there that may be of interest to you. But in terms of attracting talent from outside of Denmark's borders, that would be more Edith's Yeah, area. this yeah. is where we go abroad mm -hmm. and we both visit digital job fairs. We do uh, international talent attraction uh, via social media campaigns. And we also try to do webinars to make it easier for internationals on how to find their way in uh, Danish job search. Uh, job search is different from country to country. It's different how you target your CV and cover letter. Uh, so we help with that as well. Um, But in terms of locals, when you are here already, when you are living here as an international, that I'm guessing that people that are watching us actually live here already. Uh, I have actually some questions from viewers, so maybe that's a yeah. good question for you, because um, they ask, can you suggest the best mediums to apply for English-speaking HR jobs in Copenhagen? Do you facilitate something like that? We do not specifically facilitate something like that. There are a lot of English language websites out there, job portals out there. Um, you can find English language jobs on Work in Denmark's website. You can find English language jobs on Job Index. But a specific job portal for HR, that's kind of difficult. Mm. And that's, again, going back to a lot of the things that the industry talks about, what we hear from a lot of companies, specifically with HR, 
is that they want to know that you know some of the local rules, uh, personnel laws, and things, and things like that. Also, if you're communicating with your employees, you need to discuss specific HR issues with them, then they want you maybe to be able to speak just a little bit of Danish. Mm. So you will find HR opportunities mixed in on all the job portals that I just mentioned before. If the job requires English, you are able to conduct that job in English, you will find it there in on job index or mm. yeah work in Denmark, work in Denmark. yes yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 there are many different yeah. Yeah. but I was thinking because I was speaking with Navadita Eskesen before about the culture one thing is knowing a little bit of Danish the other thing is knowing something about the culture what do you do how do you seek a mm -hmm. job in in Denmark for instance there's uh, actually a viewer asking for that in specific uh, do you think it is a good it's good to send an unsolicited application directly uh, via LinkedIn to the department head in a big firm in Denmark. Can you just do that? Hmm? Should I take this one? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Sure. One. Yeah. It's a, yeah. <laughs> that's a question mm -hmm. we get a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's one thing that many internationals are not aware of, uh, the grey market. Uh, so actually 60% or even above 60% of all jobs that are uh, in, in private companies are actually not even posted. It's not even, it's, it's by networking and it's by knowing someone. So use your network and uh, send unsolicited job applications. It really depends what sector you're looking for because it's, of course if it's in the public sector then the jobs will always be posted but uh, applying unsolicited is a whole topic I could speak about for many hours mm -hmm. but it's oh, a great idea yeah but maybe you can <laughs> take some of that hour <laughs> yeah we also recommend uh, uh, people use unsolicited applications. Mm. Studies show that about 84% of businesses, even after the GDPR rules were implemented, still look at unsolicited applications. However, the process for how they handle unsolicited applications mm. can be different from company to company. And that's why I would not suggest that you just randomly find some company and send an unsolicited mm. application off. We recommend that you actually call the company, find out what their process is, find out if they're willing to accept the unsolicited application before you just go ahead and send. Mm. But call a company. If it's a huge company, who do you contact? Because there's uh, HR partners and there are many people you know, in the hierarchy. Who do you contact? This is where you have to be good at researching. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So if you go and you use a job portal, um, you can find certain companies and you can find previous job postings that they've done. A lot of times on the previous job postings, there will be a hiring manager or a contact person listed there. Mm -hmm. You can also use LinkedIn. There's a, you can use your network. There's mm -hmm. a lot of different ways to find a foot in the door, as we like to say, and contact that person and say, hey, uh, does your company accept unsolicited applications? How do you handle it? Yeah, and it really depends how big the organization or company is. If it's a small startup, then you start with the CEO. If it's a larger organization, try with the HR manager. But what I like to say when I meet a job seeker is I meet a lot of people who come to Denmark and they come to Copenhagen and they think this country is so amazing. They want to be part of the Hygge mm -hmm. and they say, I just want any job. I can do anything. And I say to them, okay, but if you were a single person and you were looking for a partner, would you just say, I'm just looking for any boyfriend? Mm. No, <laughs> you had to figure out what you want mm. and how, what your strengths are and what, what kind of match you are with what kind of organization. That's very important as well, especially to Danish uh, employers. They look also at the personality. So the hard skills is one thing, but the soft skills and how you match with the team, how you fit in with the organization is just as important. Mm. And how do you know that as an, uh, one who's seeking a new job? job, how to, you know, interact socially in the right manner mm -hmm. in a Danish workplace. How would you know that? Well, that's, that's where we come in. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we provide different kinds of uh, tools. We have both e-learning courses, we have webinars on uh, Danish working culture. And that's what's really difficult for internationals when they come to Copenhagen or when they come to Denmark in general. Uh, the Danish culture can seem a little bit difficult to get in. It's difficult to get to know the Danes. Usually most internationals, they have international networks and they don't know how to get to know the, the, the Danes themselves. So it's actually just about being proactive 
uh, looking for a job in Denmark uh, is a full-time job. You have to be very proactive. You have to be Johnny on the spot, the person who's always seeking opportunities. Be active on LinkedIn. Show your interest in uh, whatever field you want to work in and then just work really hard on it. Mm. It's, e it's difficult even for Danes. So, uh, of course, it's also a challenge for internationals. Yeah. Do you agree in that view that you have to like specialize in something because maybe you come from a uh, people come from a culture that where they if they start at a restaurant, you know, that is a qualification, but maybe it's not a qualification at all when you do that in Denmark. Why is it like that? This hmm? is actually one of the things that I love to mm. teach about. <laughs> because when a lot of times when internationals come to Denmark, I'm one myself, so I've mm. been through it. We come and we look at the labor market with the eyes of the labor market we just left. Mm. So if we think about supply and demand, right? The supply in the Danish labor market may be different than the supply in terms skilled workers, the supply in your previous country. The demand for a job title, the demand for a position could be different. So when internationals come here, that's one of the challenges they face, figuring out, okay, is there a demand for my type of skill? Is there a demand for what I can do? And sometimes you may find out, you know what, you may need to actually expand your view a little bit and not necessarily specialize. Mm. But how how do you know that? You know, are there certain fields that are you know more need to specialize in, or are there certain fields that you, you can be a broader um, member of? But if you're looking for a job and you're just looking for any job, it will always be more difficult to get a job. So you need to look at what is your experience from your for the country you just came from. Mm. Do you have any uh, skills that are actually that makes you stand out from the crowd because on average a Danish employer gets 50 applica uh, applications per job and in some areas it's much w bigger, it's uh, maybe 200 or even 300. So as an international you need to stand out, use your language skills, use the fact that you speak, f you're fluent in Spanish because we are, we're global so we, we have so many companies in Denmark that are international that are, where you can actually use your skills as an advantage, why not take advantage of that? But is that seen as a skill that you are a foreigner have different uh, languages? Hmm? Definitely, yes, yes. I can take this one. Hmm. Uh, one of the things, because business has Copenhagen, I work in a team called Team International. And as I said, we are responsible for the business outreach. In my team, we have actually a focus on businesses that have more of an international mindset and an international work culture. And they are definitely interested in, in, in expats because if they are considering entering a foreign market, they need to understand the market that they're going into. They need to understand the culture that they're going into. They're going to have customers that ha uh, have special language needs, marketing needs in the new market. So absolutely, there is a need for international talent in uh, the language skills that you come with and the understanding of the foreign markets that you also come with. Mm. I have a question uh, from uh, one of the viewers, uh, one who writes, Hi, I just got uh, the permanent residence via the EU family re reunification. I'm currently applying for a job and want to know if it's possible for me to, with my residence, to work in Malmö. That's a good question. Hmm? Uh, so if you're looking for... A if, um, so there, and this is where working in Denmark can also help with the registration process. Um, so... If you're from another EU country and you got, just got uh, your EU residence document to work in Denmark, you can only work in Denmark. We have cross-border workers and commuters, but then you would need uh, to register for a CPR number and a, an EU registration certificate in Sweden as well. Mm. So you, can't, you can only have one dress, a, address in e, the EU at, the, at one time. Mm. Yeah. So that's not very flexible when we talk about, you know, we have a region, the Copenhagen region, and we also, when you have a ticket to Copenhagen, you also have a ticket to, to Malmö uh, or to the southern uh, Sweden. Uh, Sweden. Uh, so you actually have to have more red tape if you have to work we have on each side of the bridge. Hmm? Well, we have cross-border workers. Mm. So it's just, this question was regarding the EU registration mm. certificate. So this was very uh, specific, right? Mm. Mm. But uh, it is possible to work across borders. Um, there's an organization called Öresund Direkt, um, which can help with um, the very specific questions regarding that matter. So it is definitely possible to work across borders. Mm. Mm. There's a question here that is linked to one of the first things you said, uh, Akila. Um, is there a place to get the information about the job fairs or career fairs held in Denmark? Is there a central place where you can get all that information? I would say 
what I usually tell internationals is the number one place to look for things happening in Copenhagen, and that is not just job fairs, networking opportunities, and you never know where your next job is coming from. So use all opportunities you can. Mm -hmm. But the number one is absolutely, unfortunately, Facebook. Saying, I'm saying that as an American, but uh, <laughs> it's unfortunately Facebook. There is not one central site. There's not one site that uh, is over all the others. There's a bunch of different sites. You have Eventbrite, which you can also find events on. There's also LinkedIn, where companies will also post events. There's also a Meetup. Uh, meetup.com where you have groups that will get together and do other specific events. So one central big site for all of Denmark? No. Unfortunately, you're going to have to go out there and do a little bit of looking around. Mm -hmm. I spoke to the the mayor uh, a minute ago about you know what COVID-19 has done uh, for the job market and uh, what is being done from the municipality. How can you um, sense that something is different uh, in your line of work now? Well, uh, when COVID-19 crashed in Denmark mm. uh, in March, we could see that all the jobs went down. Uh, and I collaborate with a lot of uh, Danish companies. We uh, collaborate with 3,600. So we are in touch with them, uh, and we are both actually. Uh, and we could see how they are not hiring, and they stopped actually hiring at some point internationals. But again, it really depends on what sector you're looking at. Mm. The IT sector still hires. Uh, it's possible to even work abroad, uh, from abroad. Uh, so I know uh, startups that were actually still hiring in March and in April when everything was closed down, when there were no flights. They were still hiring IT professionals. So the most, the most skilled you are, the more experienced and um, you know, highly specialized uh, you are, the, the bigger the opportunity is to get a job. And now we've seen in, in August that the jobs are actually going up again. So we can see that there are still Uh, open jobs. Uh, everyone is really scared of this COVID-19, but uh, I'm sure that uh, in time it will go back to normal. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah, I would agree. Uh, prior to, I believe the numbers are prior to Corona or COVID, it was about 5,000 new job postings a day during the lockdown. I think it went down to about 3,000. And then the last time I checked, which was about two weeks ago, it was up to 5,900 new job postings a day in Denmark. So there are jobs out there. The thing is, is that it's the industries, it's the sectors that you have to look at because some sectors have been hit a little harder than others. Mm -hmm. For example, hospitality, restauration, tourism, those have been a little bit harder than others. The tech industry is doing just fine. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they're doing just fine. Yeah. Um, and I was thinking, when you're an international, do you get behind the queue always when these crises happen and when, when you have a financial crisis or when you have a COVID-19 crisis? Are you, do you need to be more worried when you're an international in Copenhagen? Well, that's a good question. And it's a little bit difficult to answer because, again, as I was just saying, if you're from the right sector, then you just need to have the right skills. So if you're an IT professional and you have lots of experience with some programs where there are not enough people, then it's not a problem. But if you think in terms of um, safety, uh, it's more difficult to become a member of an ACAS when you're an international. You have to have been in Denmark for a certain number of years and they've tightened the rules quite a lot. So it is actually more difficult for an international to lose your job because you need a new one, and especially if you're from outside of the EU, because we have something called the pay limit scheme, so you have to meet some certain requirements in how much you get paid. And there's something called the positive list, which you need to be on. But it's, it, it is quite difficult for an international uh, to be part of our welfare state and to be uh, safe in this way. I would say, again, don't generalize. Mm. It depends on the industry. It depends on the skills needed in that industry, as you touched uh, a little bit uh, mm -hmm. on. I would also say it depends on the type of job. As I spoke about before, there's a lot of companies that are trying to get into foreign markets. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a company that produces baby milk, and they want to get into the China market. And they want someone who speaks fluent Chinese and understands the Chinese uh, food rules and regulations. Mm -hmm. You know, there an international is not going to be, be the last person in the queue. Of course, they're going to choose someone who has those skills that are necessary. 
If it is a marketing position and the company is solely focused on marketing in Denmark, mm. well, then you might be the last person in the queue. Mm. So don't generalize. Try it's, it, it changes from sector to sector. It changes from job title to job title. It changes from task to task. Mm. Okay. Thank you so much for your information here. And I know that you can uh, visit your booths uh, mm. in a minute yes. when we finish this uh, broadcast in a minute. Yeah. Thank and you. You can follow us also mm. on social media. <laughs> yes, so you're, you're like <laughs> and everywhere. Our newsletter, Everything, LinkedIn, Facebook, really social media. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> so you are digitally so, all over. Yes, so yes. that's good. Good right. tips and tricks <laughs> for your job search. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Thank you so much, both of you. You can find more information actually on uh, Business House Copenhagen and also work in Denmark by visiting their booth, as I just said. Uh, and this is after six o'clock when we close down for this live event. Here you can also get great insight from Copenhagen Capacity. You can visit Nordisk Job, Nordisk Job Lösning, Copenhagen Science. You can visit Øresund Direct, uh, English Job Denmark, Lyngby Torbik Kommune, there are many booths, go abroad and HR as well as the Welcome Group. All this happening at six o'clock in a minute. There was, this was everything for this show this evening. The virtual part of the International Copenhagen Citizen Day it continues until eight o'clock this evening. So please stay on this platform and find out which booths are interests for you, interesting for you. Uh, the lounge will be open, so you can have chat rooms and you can meet other internationals uh, in Living Library, for instance, with people that also have experience being an international in Copenhagen. You can always feel free to ask questions. There are many good people waiting for you to ask them and to give you all the answers you need. And don't forget um, that uh, we also have a program this Saturday, uh, where you can uh, visit l various locations and you can do that live, actually. Uh, there are some restrictions, but uh, you can uh, find out more by staying on this platform. And that's easydays.dk. Enjoy uh, these next few hours in the booths, and I hope that you have been enjoying uh, these informations. And 